I'm Rob Lukuri, a senior editor at Gold Derby, and I am delighted to be joined by the following composers, Ben McCreary, who composed the score for The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, Tom Howe, who composed the scores for Shrinking and Ted Lasso, Stephen Barton, who composed the score for Star Trek Picard, John Powell, who composed the score for Still a Michael J. Fox movie, and Ingrid Michelson, who composed the score for Tiny Beautiful Things. Welcome, everybody, to the panel. I'm so excited to have you all on board. Now, here's my first question. It's, it's a, we're going to go a little deep because a film or TV show is so often most effective and potent as an art form when it makes us feel something. Fear and joy and sadness and all those beautiful emotions. And, of course, it's the composer that has to do it. It's, it's your job to elicit that from, you know, from our heart and soul. So what are the best ways for a good score to elicit certain emotional responses in a TV show? Who would like to regale me with their thoughts first? <laughs> Bear, I think it's you. I'll go first. Uh, that's a great question. And um, my mentor when I started in the business was a composer named Elmer Bernstein, who is one of the most famous film composers of all time. And I learned a lot from him. But the thing that I learned that I use every day is he, he said over and over, there's only one thing you ever need to ask a filmmaker. What do you want the audience to feel? Don't ask them about instruments. Don't ask them about themes. Don't ask them about the temp. Just ask them that. that and, and I have found that that has bailed me out of a jam every time. Uh, that, that actually is fundamentally the job is answering that question. And um, yes, we have uh, various tools at our disposal, but I mean, I think even more fundamentally, we have to understand the task, the nuance of what you want the audience to feel. Then it's our job to go find the different colors and harmony and melody and rhythm and spotting and volume and all this stuff that is technical. But ultimately, if we don't know what the director or the showrunner wants the audience to feel, then then we're lost. I'm curious to you know if everybody else has has a similar philosophy. How do you guys approach it? I guess I, mean, I think one of the biggest challenges I think you have often have to find out is 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 the the simple art of knowing you know even when to when to not play things. Um, and you know as as filmmakers we we are first and foremost we're or filmmaker television maker whatever you know media, music synchronized with media. Um, you know, irrespective of whether it's a, a video game or even a TV show or a film, you're 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 fundamentally trying to ask the the, the question of like what's already there, um, because you know it's a team sport at the end of the day, and you know we we I've I've been a great believer that a lot of the time I I love music where it's not that I don't notice it, it's that I don't notice it being separate, uh, and I'm I notice a single cohesive experience where I I, I watch sit in the movie theater or play a video game or whatever and and all i all i know of is that there's there's the, the marriage of the two you know is something you would never want to put aside and you know i mean like i think one of the best examples of that and you know i, I often use the my, my 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 big test is my daughter you know she's nine and she when i watch her reaction to something because she's not sort of cynical or not or doesn't have any of the the, the baggage of, of of having sort of watched you know loads of movies you know, I, I with a like a moment where you know hiccup flies out in in, in dragon and, and you know flies flies down in the test drive sequence and 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 emerges from the bottom and that theme kicks in. I just watch the joy on her face and I'm like, okay, that's what we're doing. That's our job. Our job is to evoke that. Um, it's the goosebumps on the back of your neck. Um, it's uh, all of those those moments. Um, and and without ever saying like look at me i'm the music and the music is the the thing here that you should only be listening to ignore this visual nonsense you're never doing that you're always part of a team and and part of a part of a, a greater whole so well okay well on that note john i'm curious to see what you have to say about eliciting well, emotion if i if i'd known all this stuff when i started i would have done a lot better i think <laughs> that sounds really good yeah. um <laughs> yeah i mean you know, yeah, you're supposed to. Just, I don't know. The two things is that, you know, I I wanted to write music, and then I discovered that you can't make any money from it. So, <laughs> if you lend lend yourself to um, to filmmaking, you, you you know, you get some money, and you get to work with the best musicians and in great studios. The 
the downside of that is they want it to fit the picture. They want it to fit emotionally and they want it to fit, you know, visually. Um, so it's sort of a mixture of, for me, it's always been a, I, I love the inspiration of the film to try and write things. Uh, but then, you know, it's quite hard because you really have to realize you're a collaborator and that it's about the story. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. I like that. Tom? Well, I think that's it. I mean, fun of without the picture, I don't know how I would, uh, or, you know, some semblance of what it is that, that someone was wanting. I don't know how I would start. But I think that the um, one of the things I've got quite into in the last couple of years is that, you know, sometimes you're doing, you say you do a film and you have a melody that kicks in, you've got a big orchestra and you can go somewhere like Abbey Road. But sometimes you don't have that budget and you haven't got that and you have to find other ways to bring the emotion in and one of the the, the best things that I picked up working with Marcus interesting when we had those 10 days together was that he was I, I was most concerned about what theme was going to be that basically what the notes were and how it was going to uh, go with the picture and what he was most concerned about was what microphone we were using and how we were going to put it through the desk to give the warmth in the sound that he wanted I mean this in a total comp I mean as in and when you mic a piano really well and you've got it and it sounds really warm, it has a kind of depth and an emotion in it that you do not get from a kind of, you know, a MIDI kind of mock-up of whatever and ditto if you put the right vocals with stuff. And so in the last couple of years, I've got really into actually how I, um, I sort of redid my whole setup of how I had things in terms of I try where and when I've got small sounds to make sure that everything is always um you know played in some way the downside of that is when they do change the picture which they do all the time I find it much harder to fix it <laughs> but but I love that feeling of trying to get the best guitar sound I can for a said moment and so and you know what that can how that might make you feel obviously it's the notes as well but trying to kind of get the best kind of or as John just said there's the best performance right now whether that's with a big orchestra in you know Abbey Road one or whether it's it's just you know a solo guitar or solo mandolin you just want it to kind of sound as good as it can and I think that brings an emotional quality to things as well that you know hopefully elevates the music and makes it marry better with the picture and all the rest of it and the stories absolutely Ingrid you're up um I think that uh using in Tiny Beautiful Things, we we really leaned a lot on this one baritone tenor guitar and it's sort of its sound and it's woody, creaky sound. And I think there's something about having a familiar instrument that pops back up, pops back up, pops back up, that you as the viewer the goal is not to be like hey we're using that guitar again it's more it's more to elicit a sort of pinging in the brain of something familiar that i know that i've heard before that i i know that texture and it obviously is complementing whatever is visually happening uh, it's not just there for you know can't say for poop and giggles. There we go. Um, it's there for a reason. <laughs> Can I curse? Shits and giggles. Yeah. Shits and giggles. There we go. Um, I also felt like when we use my vocals was very precious. I in my um, my solo work, I'm always layering and harmonizing, and I can't stop. I'm just you have to. It's, it's bad. You have to stop me. So with this, I wanted to really be really careful because when you hear a human voice, at least for me, that does something to me also, something sort of innately human when you hear another human, even if it's ooing and aahing and there's no lyrics. So that was another thing that I felt was a little, these little emotional moments that you could have with the audience. Um, through through my vocals um, and peppering those where we where we needed them. Yeah, and what a difference some of the beautiful ooings and aahings that you've used, Ingrid, compared to like what Bear's doing on, on a track like Kazakh Doom or Numpat, where they're just kind of like, you know, it's it works, it's beautiful. And this is the same scary. thing. I mean, Ingrid's totally right. The human voice uh, is is such a powerful uh, tool in our arsenal. You know, a, a color on our paintbrush, so to speak. Um, and I definitely lean heavily 
on that. Um, they can communicate text, which also can can carry a lot of meaning, even if you don't understand it. You can feel that there's meaning. But Ingrid, you said something else that really resonated with me. That it's it, that, that I was thinking. Um, also, Tom, when you were talking about like the sound of the piano, right? That in a way, there's like this Pavlovian effect that happens. We condition the audience to have certain emotions. Some of it's innate, right? You've you've you hear a certain solo cello playing something and you you know maybe that feels happy or sad but what's so interesting about film is we can we can reassign that pretty quickly certain characters occur and it's almost like i'm going to use this sound or this theme on this person use it once and it's like oh that's interesting a second time i'm starting to connect for me at three is the magic number you use it three times the audience now understands that these things are related there's something on screen, whether it's a character or an arc or a subplot or something, and a sound. And then once you've taught them that, you can you can play with it and you set it in different contexts and you can mess around with it. And they've 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 kind of assigned, at least in the world of just your show, that this sound has this meaning. And I, I'm fascinated by that. I, I I love that. So you you can have a sound that you hear in different projects and they mean completely different things. Cause I think as composers, we intuitively understand that we're sort of teaching the audience the language that we're going to speak for this particular project and then we kind of don't break those rules once we set them up actually and one of the joys of as, as a job is that there's no there is no right answer and there's no right piece of music for a, for a particular piece of film and a wrong piece of music there's just the the way you react to it and 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 our experience of it so um you know i, I think what one of the nice things about about writing for these kinds of projects is 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 often the, the 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 both the joy and the terror of the blank page and the sort of the this idea that you can you can basically go anywhere um you just have to sort of kind of be able to sort of justify it in your mind or to whoever is paying you uh to uh what you what you're trying to do and um and whether that is 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 enhancing the experience um and so you know and i think you know certainly i when i was st you know studying music as a you know when i was young i was like it was one of those things where that uh i knew i never i didn't want to sit in a practice room and be a be a be a be an instrumental musician very much because i just did the, the sort of the loneliness of that didn't really appeal to me but the the team nature of what we do i think is 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 wonderful and the fact that you can have people who you know don't necessarily have a, a musical vocabulary um and uh, but they they can often have the, the greatest insight into what you're doing as a composer and say and ask you questions and 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 suggest things and 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 hopefully you know in, a, in when you when you have a good experience because then they're, they're not always good but um <laughs> when, when you do you get the ability to say you know uh, have someone say something really insightful that d d didn't include a piece of musical vocabulary at all but just gave you a really sort of in interesting insight into what you're what you're trying to write absolutely it's so true now before i let you guys go um i want to ask you what your favorite score is of all time i have to do that as a film nerd it's part of the it's and a tv nerd obviously it's just uh, compulsory mine um mine's modern mine's michael nine is the piano um and yeah for various reasons and and abel klosianowski's a single man will love that as well um what about you what are your favorite scores of all time? What do you love? What what inspires you the most? Uh, I'll go first, I guess. To me, the the score that I isn't my favorite, but maybe inspires me the most, is Elmer Bernstein's "To Kill a Mockingbird," which is the score wow. that, to me, defined what modern film scoring sounds like. It came out in 1960, but if you said uh, James Horner wrote that in 1992, or someone wrote it this year, you would go, "Yeah, no, that's that sounds right." It was massively ahead of its time. My personal favorite score, though, is Basil Polidorus' Conan the Barbarian. That's oh, the I love that. I love Basil. Who else? My favorite, when I was in eighth grade and I was sitting in social studies class and my teacher was cool and he, he played us the movie Glory. We got to watch it over the span of three days that score that i'm such a melody i'm just a melody head uh, 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 arrangements are not that's not my forte but that score it sunk me so it got into my bones when i was i think i was 13 years old and i, I learned it on the piano and i would just like i would sit at the piano and play it and cry like 
it because I, I would then attach it to spoiler alert you know them dying at the end and being buried in the grave together and but just that there that main theme the dun da 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 dun da 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 dun da 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 like it makes me want to cry now so many years later and i just um that them i i'm a sucker for swooping melodies and and that that movie just stuck with me and has always stuck with me and is like the the benchmark (laughs) beautiful um john uh I depend depending on the day I I tell people different ones because there's you know there's lots of really good ones. Uh, one of the ones I tell people is is Dog Day Afternoon because that's got no score <laughs> and it doesn't need it at all. Um, or, or you know because like five seasons of The Shield, not a single piece of score in it, it works well. Um, but the one I I, I think probably always uh, you, you'll get me on is Babe, um, which uses a theme by Sanson. Um, who I believe is wrote a film score or something like, like in 1901 or something before there was almost film. And um, he didn't write that way. He just wrote an organ concerto and that tune was used and, and arranged brilliantly. And, and I just remember the film starting out, watching it on the plane and it, and it starting with all these weird accents. I didn't understand the accents. I didn't know it was George. I didn't know George Miller had made it. I didn't know it was any of these things. And I was like, what is going on? I really didn't go when that tune started um well and i talked to george miller later about it is like he he just said i said why did you end up with that he said well he, he said i don't know but i just knew that was the soul of the character that's all and and so um i think when i watched it on a plane i just suddenly it it all clicked and and then i was i was in rapture all the way to the end and, and when he wins it's just it's it's one of those oh, moments man. I can hardly even think of without bursting into tears, you know. So I know. And an Australian classic too, John. Thank you. Um, all right, what about you, Stephen? Uh I don't, I mean, I don't honestly listen to a huge amount of film music. Um, but uh certainly it's not separated. I would only really ever watch it with the film, but um I would say probably of scores, if you push me, I would probably say Close Encounter, uh, Close Encounters, um, just because I think it's like the it just in terms of what it did, it was so so wildly ahead of its time, um, and just the 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 way it's structured and the way it 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 it, it marries so perfect, it's so it's so overt, but also so perfect. You know, it's not something there's there's no point at which the music takes over. It's just the 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 marriage of the two is is, is perfect and seamless and so I mean, you know i think that that's always been a been a, been a benchmark of, of just actual scores that i think think work brilliantly total sci-fi classic um tom you get the final say well i love all things ennio morricone literally but i think oh, the score that, um that probably i remember having the most influence on me actually was the original john williams superman and it's it's very obviously motive heavy but it kind of um I remember he states the theme in the very opening, just this root fifth kind of thing that then, you know, turns into the main theme. And he's, but he's got sort of very odd harmony kind of underneath it. And it all feels quite otherworldly. And then you have these electronics on Krypton and kind of these huge sort of brass things going on. And then he goes to small one. It's like old Americana kind of, you know, like amazing string writing. And then you go to sort of, it's in, you know, Metropolis and it's different again. And then you've got that kind of march that you kind of remember, but it sort of had, you know everything for me and i thought it was a really just you know brilliant writing but the you know the orchestration was just you know unbelievable and uh yeah a huge fan of his across everything he did obviously as well but i remember that one having a particular impact and i just remember thinking god this is such a wide palette you know this the stuff at the beginning kind of like early electronics and then kind of going you know forward from there but it's um yeah probably that one That's a good choice. I think you all made some beautiful choices. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. This has been a real dream for me. I love talking to composers. I really appreciate your time. Congratulations on some beautiful work. Thank you. This has been fun. Thanks for having me.